Crossroads. <laughs> so we're going to do something a little bit unusual before we get started. So if you all, if you guys have your hand out, uh, looks like this on the inside, it says stereo on the front. It's a little bit unusual format. But if you notice on the very front section here, uh, you've got a space to uh, do a little activity. So I'm a student pastor, so I can do activities once in a while. So we're going to do, we're going to do a really cool version of our welcome reading time. So what I want you to do, listen very carefully to the instructions, they're very important. I want you to get up out of your seat, I want you to say hi to at least three people that you don't know, and then I want you to sit back down next to somebody that you didn't come here with. So maybe you just switch spots with your spouse, so you can sit next to somebody who you don't know very, very well. Okay? And then what, here's what you're going to do. You're going to have three or four minutes after that time, after you guys sit down, to share your favorite Bible verse, it can be John 3.16. Or you can just randomly flip to one and call your favorite. And then you have to share with that person how it's changed your life, how it's changed the way that you've thought, or how it's brought you closer to Jesus. And then after about a minute and a half or so of that, uh, you're, you're going to switch, and that person's going to share the same thing with you. So if, if I'm partnering with Earl here, I'm going to share with Earl that my favorite verse is Colossians 1, 19-20. It's not how it's changed my life. And after about a minute or so, Earl's going to share with me the same thing in return. And I'm going to write it down. And then I'm going to call stop. All right, and then we're going to get into it this morning. All right, we all clear? Any questions? All right, you got two minutes to say hi to three new people, and then sit down with somebody that you don't know very well, and share your favorite Bible book. We'll be right back. So I'm really excited for our new series. Uh, some of you guys are less excited because it's about that E word that we don't like to talk about very often, but it's evangelism. Yeah, you got real quiet here, real quick. Uh, I should have said evangelism so that they can clap. Uh, but we're in this new mini-series uh, that's really important. Um, if you think about it, this is one of those things that makes us uncomfortable, that we don't like doing. Let's all just admit that up front. Um, just everyone raise your hand if you're a little bit uncomfortable sharing the gospel sometimes with people. Okay. Okay, good. We should, get, we should admit that. The first step to recovery is maybe we have a problem. Uh, so, good. We're right out of the way. Uh, so we're starting this new series called Stereo. Good news for listening world. Can you put that title slide back up? There's one person I want to recognize. That awesome line drawing there, that, that ancient boom box from like when I was born. That was done by one of our very own students, Abby Ashby. Where's she at? <laughs> she, 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 she did that from hand. She did it by her, you know, with no help uh, in her brain. So it's pretty awesome. So Stereo, good news for a listening world. Uh, and the reason I had you do that little activity in the beginning is not because I like to do childish things, but because if we're honest with each other, as Christians, we're not that great at spiritual conversations. In fact, some of you guys found that very simple task really daunting. And like I said, for those of you guys who are new this week, I'm really sorry that did something weird, right? Um, but on the other hand, since you're new, you have a really hard time, a really easy time, finding something you didn't know very well. So those are give and take. But we don't do spiritual conversations very well. We're just not very good at it. But, but that doesn't make any sense, does it? It doesn't make any sense at all that we are awkward. We're awkward. Uh, and the truth is, is that a lot of us are, are weird in areas that we were never called to be weird in. And we blend in areas that we were called to stand out in. And one of the ways that we were called to stand out in is sharing the gospel. That Jesus' last words have to do with evangelism. He says, go into all the world and make disciples teaching them to obey the right hand of you, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I know I mixed that up. But he says, go make disciples. And it doesn't just say go and make disciples. In fact, the, the word that he uses for go is a gerund. I'm going to be grammatically correct here. It's not an active verb. It means as you go, as you go about your life, as you go and about what you do, the normal things that you do, as you go grocery shopping, and as you go to the store, and as you go take your kids to soccer practice, and as you go to work, as you go about your normal life, make disciples. And that involves sharing the gospel, sharing the good news. And I think if a lot of us are really honest, we also feel woefully unequipped to do that, especially in a world that's becoming increasingly more secular day by day by day. Every day that goes by, our worldview is further removed from the worldview of the predominant culture, am I right? So we feel unequipped to do that. And yet, the goal of the church, uh, if you ask me what my job description is, it's not to just share the gospel with a bunch of people who come to the building on Sunday. It's to equip you guys, to equip our students, and to equip you to do the work 
to, to share the gospel, and it says, Ephesians says, to equip them to do the works of service so that the church may reach its full maturity in Christ Jesus. That's my job, is to help you do that. And I feel that I don't help you guys do that. If we as crossroads don't help you guys do that on your own, then we're, then we're not doing our job. So we're just in the next few weeks talking about how to share our faith, to inspire you and equip you to, to bring good news to a listening world. But first I want to start in the beginning in the fact that evangelism starts at, at its core with the love of God and His pursuit of us as His children. Um, now, I don't, how many of you guys in here love music? Okay? I'm a big music fan, I'm a wannabe musician, and when I, um, when I get into a band, I really, I really t- I tend to buy all their albums, I try to go to their concerts, I watch their concerts on YouTube, and I, I really enjoy them. One of the things I've enjoyed lately is the return of folk music as a phenomenon lately. Uh, any of you guys Mumford & Sons fans? Okay, Woo, thank you. I love Mumford & Sons, I love folk music, I've always loved folk music, uh, my family is Irish, uh, and so I enjoy the kind of Celtic folk sort of feel. But there's a Christian band uh, that, uh, that is a lot, very folky, it's not a lot of my songs, but I really love it. And you've probably heard this song on the radio uh, by a band called The Rent Collective Experience. And it's a, it's a song called Build Your Kingdom. And I'd like to share it with you right now. I have it on my phone here, so I'm just going to let you, I'm going to let you listen. It's a really great song. I think you're going to enjoy it. Oh, this is my favorite part, listen. Can you feel that? Yes! Yeah, it's good, right? Yeah, it's so good. I'm sharing it with you, right? And you can totally hear it. Right? Some of us treat the gospel that way. We have this great song that we love, this Savior we love, and we're really excited about it, but we share it with each other just like that. Like, can you hear it, right? Like, we think that if we just love it enough on the inside, that people are just going to kind of hear that song in our lives. And we don't share. We just keep it to ourselves. Really, is what we're doing. Now, other people, and, and this is why evangelism is so hard for us in our culture, because there have been some people who have gone out and said it the totally wrong way. Let me, you know what, this will help you hear this song. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear that better? Okay, here we go. Is this on? No. You can hear that though, right? Let's do it like this. There we go. Hello? Hello? You can hear it though, right? Kind of? Sort of? So. Yes. so good. Good. Right? Uh, so, but the sound quality is not that great, right? Just like people out, uh, uh, you know, shouting on the street corner like this, like, hey, have you guys seen people come to this? Like, hey, guess what? God hates sinners, and you're going to hell, and you need to repent right now. Yeah. And that's really effective way to evangelism, <laughs> except that it's not. So, but even if you managed to hear the message of the song, it didn't sound very good, did it? I mean, it's coming on my iPhone, and I don't care if there's any Apple employees here. This is not the greatest speaker in the world. Okay? <laughs> and, and I put it through this microphone, which isn't meant to be a like that. But... Let me, let me, I want you to close your eyes. I'm going to play for you part of the song in stereo, the way it was meant to be heard. All right, so, this. Just 
what, what's the value? He just holds it there. All he does is show. And there's no tell. Right? There's no tell. Well, is it important to you? Do you love it? Do you sleep with it? Does it have a name? Is it missing a button? What, what about it? What about, what about it? Do you treasure? What's so important about it? Why should I care about your teddy bear? And now imagine the other way. Imagine if your son or daughter comes to preschool and says, hey, it's time to show and tell. Uh, and they got up and they said, well, I have this teddy bear. And um, it's been nice and soft. You know, it smells. Uh, and he's missing a button in his right eye. And I just love him so much. And everything. And they said, well, what did you bring? Said, show and tell. I'm supposed to bring something. No, I didn't bring it. I, I didn't bring it. And it was just tell. There's no, there's no show. But isn't it great if there's show and tell? Isn't the song great if it's in stereo? It's heard the way it's meant to be heard, where the, the actions of our life and our devotion to Jesus and our service to Him and it comes out of our lives and seeps out of our pores in a way that people go, man, there's something different about you. And then they go, what's so different about you? And they go, let me tell you. This is the stereo part, where I go, the reason I'm different, the reason I have joy, I have hope, and, I, and the reason I'm a different person is because of Jesus. Imagine if people in this world heard the gospel in stereo, the way it was meant to be heard. Not kept to ourselves, not shouted at them through a megaphone, rudely, without compassion, but in stereo. And that all begins with the way that God loves us, because here's the first one. God loves us in stereo. God loves us in stereo. He didn't just tell us, he showed us. Look at this verse in Colossians 1. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. In fact, if I had participated in my own charade a minute ago, I would share this verse. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He didn't just give the, the, the Old Testament to Moses and the law to Moses and say, here, do this stuff. Here's how you should live. Here's what I'm like. He said, you know what? They need an example in the flesh. They need something done for them. So I'm going to, he says, he was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Who's the him? Who's the him? Jesus. Jesus. Remember that Jesus is fully God, right? His fullness dwell in the person of Jesus. I'm going to show them who I am. I'm going I'm to put flesh and bone to my character. I'm going to bring them to myself. He loves us in stereo. It's not this mono sort of, you know, kind of crackly version of who God is that we get by reading the Word. It's the stereo version. Because you say, well, I wonder what God was like. I read these stories, but I wonder what He was like. Look at Jesus. Exactly what God was like. He loves us in stereo. He showed us, and He told us, and He reconciled us to Himself through His shed blood on the cross. And then he gave us a job to do, didn't he? He gave us a job to do. But his last words before he leaves the earth are, go and make disciples. Tell people about me. Just before he is, is taken into heaven, his last words to the church are, behold, you're going to receive power. To what? To be witnesses. To be witnesses. I'm so glad, I'm so thankful he spent the last 11 weeks talking about the Holy Spirit. Because boy, you are going to need him after these three weeks. You're going to receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the ends of the very earth. And pray for them. We've got people this week, 17 of them, who have taken a flight to the ends of the earth to share this good news. Continue to pray for them for the next couple of weeks. He loves us in stereo and he's given us a job to do. And I know that you guys have your own jobs and you have your own families and one last task on the list is not helpful to you. But man, this is it. This is, this is the eternal priority. Because we're going to discover, as we get through these next three weeks, that if, if nobody else does it, it's not going to get done. Because God has sovereignly placed it on all of us. Not just me, not just Nanda, not just our elders, not just those who are gifted, but on all of us. To tell people. Our job as Jesus followers is to tell others the good news. That's our job as Jesus followers is to tell other people the good news. 
Notice that Jesus doesn't say before he's sent to in heaven, hey guys, now create an organization and uh, um, a job chart and uh, get a finance committee together and build a building and do all these programs and collect backpacks and do all this stuff and make a nice sign and a website and a logo and all that stuff. Do all that stuff. This would be really great. What does he say? Go make disciples. Go be my witnesses. Go tell them what I've done. Go tell them what I've said. Because it's going to change the world. It's going to change the world. Last week we talked about, we introduced the, the Harvest Crusade coming up in September. I talked just for a second about Andrew. The Apostle Andrew. We know very little in church history about what Andrew did after the resurrection. But one thing that's really important that we have recorded in scripture is that he introduces somebody pretty important to Jesus. It's his brother Peter. I mean, if the only thing you ever do in your life is bring somebody to Jesus, you have no idea what kind of world you could be changing. I mean, can you imagine if Andrew was like, yeah, Jesus is cool, but I don't, I don't know. Peter might not like him. Peter doesn't want to hear about him. Peter's busy, he's fishing. Could you imagine if Peter never met Jesus? If Andrew was never like, dude, you've got to meet this he says some pretty amazing things. Can you imagine what the world would be like if that had never happened? Can you imagine what the world might be like if, if you shared the gospel with your brother or sister, or the person in the cubicle next to you, or the mom next door? You have no idea what God's got planned for them. It's our job to share the good news, to tell people the good news about Jesus. And guess what? I can back that up with scripture. Look at Romans 10. Oh, should have let that song, sorry. It says this. Let's check this out. How then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? Makes sense, right? You can't believe on somebody that you've not called out to. You can't believe in someone that you can't call out and very much someone that you don't believe exists. How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard about? You can't believe in people that you have never heard about. Even if you believe in Santa, at least someone told you about it. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And that word preaching, people get tripped up on that. Because the word preaching simply means to proclaim. Right? Simply means to be a herald, to tell somebody. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? How can anyone preach unless they are sent? And let me tell you right now, from this, from this moment on, we send you out. We give you permission to share the gospel, okay? Be free to do this. Okay? You don't need permission. You don't need a permit. Yet. Be this. Okay? Do this. It's a good idea. It's our job as youth followers to, to share the gospel, to tell people about the good, good, good news. But the problem is, is our, our lives are so mixed up with stuff. Our lives have uh, uh, packed schedules and jumbled priorities. And our lives... Speak to people things that maybe we don't want them to be spoken. I remember uh, I didn't grow up in the church until I was about 12 or 15 years old. And uh, one of the reasons the first couple of years I didn't come to Jesus and give my life to him wasn't because I didn't believe that Jesus was the Savior or that he forgave my sins or anything else like that. It's because I looked around at my friends in the youth group, the people I went to school with, went to church with, and I, I thought, and they speak the same, they act the same. They live the same, and they hope the same thing, everybody else. So why on earth would I be a Christian? What, what advantage does it give me to give my life to Jesus if it doesn't change my life? Because their lives, and I'm not trying to be too harsh on them, but their lives didn't speak to me the good news of the gospel. I had no idea why that news was good. So someone finally explained to me the heart of the gospel. But our lives sometimes give a mixed message. It looks sometimes like we're hoping in the same thing that everybody else is hoping in. And so here's the key for us. We need to find the song worth playing. We need to find the song worth playing. Know the song worth playing. Because a lot of us are singing this song in life about achievement and work and status and wealth. 
I live in California. People, so I grew up in the Midwest. People think it's cool that I live in California. And you guys are like, why? I don't believe it. <laughs> what we do with most of the People think it's about what you do for a living or uh, how well your kids are doing in school. I, I, I happen to work with a lot of teenagers, a lot of parents, not just here, but in schools and I've coached some sports. And one of the things we mentioned in our parent workshop this morning was that some people use their kids as the status symbol. Like I've raised some really talented kids, they're really smart, and they, they do this or that, and they're the president of this and the vice president of that, and they can kick a soccer ball like in million yards, and they can bend it like that them, and they can play the violin and all that stuff. And, Right. Use it as a badge of honor. That's the song that they're playing. But you know when you, when you hear that song they really love? And maybe, maybe it was like that first Beatles song you ever heard, or the first Stone song you ever heard, or um, so you guys who just never listen to, to Christian music, maybe it's Petra, I don't know, you like, or Michael W. Smith, you're like, oh yeah, no question, man, I love this song. <laughs> you, um, you heard this, this great song that you love, and what did you do? You took that record to your friend's house, or you, you played it on the radio for your girlfriend, or you, you played that song because you thought it was so worth playing, like, how could you not love it? How could you not want to hear this song? But some of us are playing a song that, that nobody wants to hear, and it isn't an ultimately worth playing. Look at what, what Paul says in Romans 1. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul knows exactly the song worth playing. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Paul says, listen, I know the song we're playing. I know its consequences. I know what it means to me. I know that eventually it's probably going to mean my death. I've already been in jail. I've already been beaten. I've been kicked out of Jerusalem. But it's the power of God for salvation. And so therefore, I don't care. It's the song we're playing. Because it's the power of God that saves people. That does what Colossians 1 says. That reconciles people to God. Because there are people who are far off, who have no idea, who have no hope, who are going to live this world in this world for themselves. They're going to accumulate their stuff and they're going to die. And there's no you all buying verses, right? So I'm going, this is the song we're playing. No matter what the cost, I'm going to play. Some of you just got the you all buying verses. Thing. Good. <laughs> and here's the next part. You need to play that song at full volume. What do you do when you, when you find that song you love? You crank it up to 11. Right? You crank it up to 11. And your parents say, turn that music down! <laughs> and you're like, but it's Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> you play it full volume. So listen, you need to hear this. Above all the noise of this world, above everything else you can be listening to, you got to hear this song. It's so good. That's why I put that song for y'all. I really like that song. I don't like it much as I like the gospel. But I play it at full volume. Just listen to this. Matthew 4, Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. That's dumb. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. Let your light shine. Play the full light. Let your light shine. You're strategically placed as a city on a hill. No one just goes, oh, I'll build a city over there. Sure, why not? Maybe if you're playing Farmville, you can do that. But no, some of you guys know like I play Farmville. Obviously. No one says, I'm supposed to deal with it. You should be placed in the ancient world. Cities were placed on a hilltop, not only for protection, but so that travelers, if they traveled through valleys and through the region, they could see and navigate based on the city lights and the building. They could go, oh, Bethlehem's over there, and Megiddo's over there, and Jerusalem's way up ahead, and it's super bright. I know where I'm going, I know where I'm headed. And you can't hide a city on a hill that's all lit up, can you? I love coming down 680 at night. It's like as you come into the valley, you see the valley sort of spread out before you and all the lights are on her. I love sitting at the hilltop of Valley Christian, just looking over Silicon Valley and seeing all the lights. And I think, man, what, what if the church shined like that? What if it was unmistakable or unmistakable, whichever those is the word, 
What if it was unmistakable? What if we shine like that? Let your light shine so that what? People might see your good deeds and ultimately what? Glorify your Father. So another song we're playing. Play it at full volume and then, here's, here's the really important part. Share it with everyone in our own reach. Share it with everyone in our own reach. I remember when I was in high school, uh, there's a vulnerable moment here. I was in high school and there was this girl I liked uh, who wasn't as tall or pretty as my wife is now. <laughs> and uh, uh, I really liked her a lot. She was really cool and she was kind of like, she's kind of artsy and she like walked around school with her shoes on and stuff. And she was funny. Um, there's this band I really liked. And I thought she'd like it too. So I was at the concert and I thought, you know what? I'm going to get the CD and I'm, I'm going to go backstage and wait in line and get signed by the band. And I'm going to give it to her. And she'll fall in love with me. We'll ride away on a white horse. <laughs> that happens in your life, right? I thought, I'm going to share with her. She's going to love it. And then in turn, she's going to like me a lot. It didn't work out. But the point is, is that I, I shared it. I shared it with someone who was, who was close to me. And we do that with music. We do that with art. We do that with Pinterest. Right? All right? Only my wife is laughing in the front. I know some of you guys are on Pinterest. Because I know some of you follow her. <laughs> so you, you share things you like, oh, great muffin recipe, or uh, I have this picture on Facebook. We share things that are important to us in the world, don't we? We live in a social media culture where we can share pics of ourselves at the beach, or hey, I took my picture of myself in the mirror and posted it on the internet because people care. And you know, we do that, right? We share things with everyone on this reach all the time. So much so that it's crazy. Like, I don't want to see your cat video. Don't. You know, just don't. Do. But we should people in arm's reach. And the same thing ought to be true of the most important thing to us. Our salvation in Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say? For salvation is found in no one else. So if we have the only answer, if we've got the best song to sing, why do we not share it with more people? Is it that we believe that people don't want to hear it? That's not good enough? Do you think the gospel is not compelling enough to people? In a minute, we're going to talk about a couple things that we believe that are untrue about evangelism. Hopefully we can dispel some of those myths. Look at what 1 Peter 3 says. Always be prepared to give an answer. That word answer means a defense. To everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. And back to that point. If you have never had anyone ask you for the reason of the hope that you have, it just might be that it looks like you hope in the same thing that everyone else hopes in. It just might be that it looks like that you hope in the same thing that everyone else has hope in. But if people are giving you a weird stare, like how come, you know? Like you need to know that, that right now, as you sit in your seat, you're this giant minority here in San Jose. Give or take, only one in ten people are in a church right now. So if you go out to a restaurant afterwards, or you go to Target or whatever, nine out of ten people found themselves not here or somewhere else while you were here. So you're weird. Just own that, okay? You're unique. You've obviously got some hope in something else. So share that with somebody. Take somebody out to lunch afterwards. Call up your neighbor. Hey, what you do this morning, Bob? Funny you should ask. I went to church. Oh, really? How can you do that? Why do you like it so much? Well, let me tell you about it. And it's not because our community crackers taste so good. Right? That's not why we're here, and ultimately. We're not here because our kids are entertaining and it's free babysitting. We're not here because the worship band you know, like just you know, rocks our faces off and it's awesome. That, that's true. All those things are true. All those things are good. But that's ultimately why we're not why we're here. We're here because we have hope in Jesus Christ. Because He has reconciled us to Himself. We are His sons and His daughters. We are His children. And that's the most important truth in all of the universe. C.S. Lewis says that either Christianity is ultimately important or it's not important at all. There's no in between. But some of us treat our faith like it's just oh yeah. By the way, I'm an engineer, and I'm a husband, and I'm a dad, and I like soccer, and I drive a uh, minivan. Oh, by the way, I'm a Christian. Share it. 
share it with everyone in arm's reach. Because there are so many people out here who just need to know Jesus. And we want to, in the next couple of weeks, just equip you to do that. We want to equip you to do what this verse says. Look at this verse. You guys know this verse. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Right? We know that part. We love Jesus. We worship Jesus. We sang songs about how great is our God. But what's the next part of that song? Sing with me. That song that we sang, How Great Is Our God, is a call to invite other people to worship Jesus. Sing with me how great he is. How do they know if he's great if they don't know? How are they going to sing if they don't know? How are they going to know if you haven't told them? How are, they, how, how are you going to tell them if they don't send you? What's the second part of that verse? And love your neighbor as yourself. You love Jesus. And you love that Jesus loves you. So what's the natural extension of that? What's the ultimate expression of love for us as, as Christians? To share Jesus with them. He's the ultimate good. What's so great about heaven? It's not mansions. It's not gold. It's not the crystal sea. It's not putting down our crowns in front of Jesus. It's the presence of God. That's the most important thing. Everything else is bonus. Everything else is rainbows and unicorns, right? It's God being present with us. Fully fulfilled. That, that heart that just longs for the presence of our creator. That's it. That's why we want to get there. That's why we want to bring people with us. Because deep inside your heart, because you've read the Bible, you know the scriptures, you know where they end up if you don't. You know. And yet, we're afraid. Because we believe some things about evangelism that just aren't true. Satan has whispered some things into our hearts. Keep us from telling everybody else. I don't know if you guys have ever read Screw Tape Letters. But it's about this guy who kind of becomes a Christian and this dialogue between uh, uh, a demon and his uh, protege and a nephew. And he says, Listen, you don't have to convince him that Jesus isn't the Savior, that Christianity isn't true. You just have to keep, you have to just keep his mouth shut up. Keep him just hanging out at church. Keep him, keep him standing. Keep him lukewarm. So don't let him tell anybody about it. And we'll be okay. It's okay to lose one as long as we don't lose more. That's his scheme. He wants you to just shut up about it. That's what he wants you to do. So I want to just spell a couple myths. There's five myths we believe. First is this. Tolerance myth. The tolerance myth. This is huge for us in California, isn't it? Right? Californians believe that we should never express our opinion to anybody else. Let me give you a prime example. It's going to seem really dumb, but it's really important. Yesterday, I spent time with six of our students. Uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, I gave them the job and said, okay, by the time it's 11.30, you guys can just decide amongst yourselves where we're going to go to eat over here. Pick any of these fast food joints over here and where we're going to go to eat. All right? You think easy enough, right? Where are we going to eat lunch? But on the car ride back to church, right before we go to, go, go to lunch, where are we going to go? Oh, I don't really know. I kind of like this, but what do you like? And, like Six people couldn't decide where to have a topic, right? Because we didn't want to put our opinion or our desires on anybody else. So our culture says, don't do that, it's not right. That's not true. That's certainly not biblical. Look at Matthew 5. Look at this verse. We talk about this, being, uh, let your light shine. It says, let your light shine. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Let people see. Because when they see and they hear, they're going to glorify me in heaven. It's a myth. The myth of tolerance. The myth that my faith is a private issue. It's never been a private issue. If it was a private issue, the, the apostles would never have given their lives for it. If it was a private issue, we, we, that we'd never have the New Testament. Because Jesus would have gone to heaven and gone, and they were all gone, sweet, that was pretty cool. Let's go hang out. No, it's never been a private issue. It's not biblical. That's not from the Lord. I want you to tell people about it. Second myth is this. The secret agent myth. The secret agent myth. See, I, I love James Bond movies, and I love, you know, spy movies and stuff, but uh, the secret agent myth that my life is my message. Well, if I just live a good life, they're going to figure it out. I'm just going to let my life shine, and they're going to figure it out. Imagine that if you were in a boat, and you saw a lighthouse, but you had no idea what it meant. 
And none of the people on board knew what that lighthouse meant. Ah, oh, what's that light up there for? I don't know, let's keep going. What happens? Crash, right? We lost the Titanic, it goes down. Imagine, if you, if you show, but never tell. We, we did Romans 10 already. How, how are people going to know if you don't preach to them? Because a, a lot of people who are religious live really good, upright lives. I'm sure you all pay your taxes, and you're great neighbors, and you're great employees, and you, you've mastered all these Christian virtues, and you're a good person, right? How many of you here are a good person? Don't you raise your hand. Jesus made you righteous, but you're not a good person. All of you guys live great lives. You're all speaking clean, right? Why? I know the answer. You know the answer. But nobody else does. Unless you wear a Christian t-shirt every day of your life. Which is an option, I guess. Casual you know, Fridays every day for me. Secret agent myth. Next thing, superstar myth. I think this is the one that stops us the most. It's not my gift. Well, I'm not an evangelist. Pastor, you remember Ephesians 4, right? He's given evangelists and pastors and teachers, right? I'm not an evangelist. It's not my gift. Pastor, I took that spiritual inventory you gave me, and evangelist wasn't in my top five. It's not my gift. What, is, what does Jesus say in Matthew 28? To the entire church. 120 people. The whole, the whole thing. He didn't say, hey, listen, I want you to create a specialized job description for people who are going to share the gospel. Everybody else just bring cookies. <laughs> right? That's not what he said. He said, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey without what I commanded you. Go and tell some people. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, now, keep a corner of sound doctrine. Do, do the work of an evangelist. But, but Timothy's this shy, timid guy, he's got some health issues, he's kind of young, doesn't feel gifted, doesn't feel called. Paul says, suck it up, buttercup. Do the work of an evangelist. It's your job. Not because it's your job, like, like you clock in for your job. It's, it's what you're called to do. Do the work of an evangelist. So you have to be a superstar. Next week, we're going to have one of my best friends in the whole world, Tim Riley, preach. And he's an evangelist. He's a superstar. Okay? But you know what? If I told him, if we went to coffee and I said... Listen, Tim, I just want you to come over to my apartment and share the gospel with my friends. He would punch me in the face. And he would say, suck it up. It's your job. It's your neighbor. I don't know them. They're going to spray mace in my face. You know? I don't know them. You're quick to, to handle that. You're going to be a superstar. You're going to be an expert. Just, just do it. Share your story. Share the love of Jesus in you. Share your favorite Bible verse. Guess what? I secretly equipped you. You didn't know I was equipping you, but I secretly equipped you. Ha. Fourth myth. Expert. I just don't know enough. All of you know enough. Okay? All of you know enough. You don't need to go to an extra Bible study. You don't need six extra classes. You don't need to, you don't need to get like some sort of online certification to share the gospel. You need to know what Jesus did for you, and then you need to know that he wants you to share with somebody else. Okay? That's like, that's like pulling out like some ready-baked cookie dough uh, from, the, from the kitchen at the fridge and saying, well, I don't really know how to bake. Oh my goodness, scoop it on the pan, put it in the oven. It's not that hard. You don't have to be an expert, okay? You don't have to be an expert. You already know enough. If you've been here like a week, you probably know enough. You've just, you just been told that, that you don't know enough, that you need to learn, that you need to grow, that you need to be mature first. You don't have to go through a class. You don't have to get a tattoo. You don't have to like have this tragic story. You don't have to do that. You don't have to be an expert. Fifth one, apathy. People just aren't open. People just aren't open. Let me read you Luke 10, 2 through 3. Let's set this on here. This is Jesus talking to him. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, I believe that God is sovereign. He's in control of all things. And you know what this verse tells me? There are people out there who are predestined and elect 
to know Jesus, to be his child. And in his sovereign will and goodness, he has put it on us to do that sharing, to connect the dots between a loving God and a broken child. To say, listen, you're far from God. Maybe you don't know it because your life is going just fine, but you're far from him and he loves you. And your eternity is at stake. And I know the answer. I know the way home for you. She says, look out there. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. I'm asking right now. I'm standing here at this platform asking God right now to send some of you guys out into that harvest field, into your neighborhoods, into your places of business, into your, uh, your son and daughter's dance troupe or soccer club or chess club or math leads club or, or asking them, you're sending into your PTA meetings or your, um, your, your uh, mom's groups or your uh, softball teams. I'm asking God to send you in there to infiltrate this place for the glory of God and the joy of all people. You think that people don't care. You think that people aren't perceptive. They're not open. And you think that you shouldn't share with them. You think you don't know enough. You think it's not your gift. But you're wrong on all of those things. My job, my job mostly as a pastor is to tell you where you're wrong. Right? So you're like, uh, no, there are certain lies we believe, but particularly in this area, that keep us just sitting here in our chairs going, okay, good sermon, Pastor, great worship, sign my offering, done. Because you, you feel like you can't do anything else. But gosh, you have a song to sing. You have a powerful story. Whether you came to Christ as a seven-year-old 70 years ago, or you came to Christ this week, you have a story to share. And it's powerful. Because if you think about the gospel, and we're going to talk more about exactly what the gospel is, next week. When you think about the gospel, the God of the universe came down and said, listen, my, my kids are far from me. My children, whom I love, whom I made my image, they're far from me. They're ruining their lives with sin. They don't know how good it can be. And I love them too much to let them stay that way. I'm going to send my son, I'm gonna put my, the fullness of my character and my goodness in this human being. And then, you know what? I'm going to let them, whom I love, kill him in, in their place shed his blood, bury him, and then, surprise ending, I'm going to raise him from the dead so they can have eternal life so I can spend eternity with them. Because God wants something more to spend eternity with you and your friends and your relatives and your co-workers and your kids. Why wouldn't we share that? It's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's the best song ever. Don't let those lies, the things that we believe, keep you from doing that. And this is only week one. Right? We've got two more weeks of this, to, and we're going to share with you some really practical tools. This week, we just want to inspire you and move your heart in that direction. But this week, take this first part where you share your favorite Bible verse, and just say, hey man, can we really lunch together? I just want to share with you one thing. Will you, give me, will you give me two minutes just to share something important in my life? Just you share your favorite Bible verse? Then I give you a look like. And then they ask me to eat lunch with you again. That's okay. At least you were obedient. At, at least you took a step. At least you said, listen, it's, it's just too important for me not to share this with you anymore. You have a powerful song to sing. I'm going to share with you a poem. I know, guys, songs and metaphors and poems, but just bear with me, right? It's a great poem by a great American named Walt Whitman. It's called Oh Me, Oh Life. It's in print. Oh Me, Oh Life. Of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish. Something where you live. Of myself forever reproaching myself, for who more foolish than I, and who more faithless? Of I that vainly crave the light, of the objects mean, of the struggle ever reviewed, some of the monotony of life, just, oh, I go to work and I come home, and I go to work and I come home, and it's the same thing all over again. I can't take it anymore. There's got to be something deeper. Of the poor results of all, of the plodding and sorry crowds I see around me, of the empty and useless years of the rest, with the rest, me intertwined. The question, oh me, oh sad recurring. What good amid these, oh me, oh life? That's the question answered. What good amid these, oh me, oh life? Answer. That you are here. That life 
exists an identity which we know in this building we know is in truth. Christ. That the powerful play goes on. Listen to this part. That the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. That the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. How beautiful is that? That the God of the universe has written this play on the stage of life and you may be part of it. That you may contribute a verse. That you have a song to sing, a powerful testimony, something to share with the world that's way more important than anything you've ever dreamed of. So I want to ask you um, just one question before you go. Let's put it in the bottom hand up there. What, what would your song sound like if, if you played it before? If you decided this moment off, listen, I just love Jesus. And I've been, I've been playing it on two instead of eleven. And I gotta crank it up. I, I, I gotta get, I gotta get through it. What, what would that song sound like if you played it full on? And for some of you, I'm, I'm playing the wrong song altogether. And so I'm, I'm afraid what would happen if I turned up to eleven. What, what would your song sound like if you played it full on? How would your world be impacted if suddenly people around you could hear the beautiful music of your salvation? I want to read you a verse from Psalm 40. It's, it's beautiful. They, uh, guys, if you think that poetry and music is girly, uh, David wrote some great stuff and he was a man. Right. Psalm 40. To the choir master, a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry blog. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. This is his part. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. That's my prayer for you this week. That many people will see and hear, see and fear the Lord, and put their trust in your God because of the song that you sing. I want nothing more. Nothing more to you than to experience that joy, that rush, that just moment of adrenaline where your where your heart and your mind communicate for a brief second. You realize, oh, what? What? That person is going to be headed now. That's cool. And then you're like, yes, and you must come to church now. And I love you. Let me pray for you, brother. Right? But for that moment, you realize that you have contributed a verse, a powerful play. Let me pray for you. We're going, to, we're going to worship Jesus. Any, any of you guys feel like we ought to just worship Jesus right now? I feel like that. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you are sovereign over everything. You are good and you are wonderful. You have put a song in our heart. You have taken us from the miry body. You set our feet upon a rock and you have made our steps secure. You put a new song in my mouth in the mouth of the church, that people may see and fear and put their trust in. God, we live in a world where people put their trust in so much just stupid stuff. They, they reach for handholds that will give way. They step on a rung of a ladder that will break. God, empower us by the Holy Spirit to share that song in full volume, to share with everyone at, at, at arm's length to not believe the lies of the enemy that tell us that they don't care, or we shouldn't share, or that we don't know enough, or it's not our gift. God, help us to just shine bright. I remember the young lady said that, that lights don't need permission to shine. They just shine. So God, just help us to shine so bright that people might ask for a reason of the hope that we have inside of us. And that we'd be ready to give a defense, to give an answer. But I pray that you would teach us to just love the gospel. Teach us to love the good news. Help us to see and to feel down to our very bones how good the good news is. And give us this holy, amazing burden. Though none go with me, I still will follow. 
help us to do these, these things that you say are only by your spirit. We don't save anybody, but you use us to rescue others. I ask this for our church, for our people, for the, for the glory of the Lord, for the joy of all people. Let's just celebrate Jesus one more time before we leave this morning. Let's stand on our feet and sing this. It's all because of Jesus I am alive.
last week, but I want to bring attention again. On the back, five spots. Number one through five. These are for people that you love and care about. Uh, who you want to see come to the Harvest Crusade, September 28 and 29, that you want to hear the gospel, that you want to love Jesus, that you want to be in heaven with you. So start now. Start now. Even though it's nine weeks away, I want you to start now intentionally talking to these people. Invite them over for dinner. Invite them out for lunch. Take them to Starbucks. And, and put them in this list of you to pray for them. The second thing I want to mention to you is uh, I'm going to give you a moment to take this envelope out. It says impact. Uh, we want to take a special offering today. We've been talking about this for a couple weeks. For our students, uh, for our kids. Um, we have a great student ministry and uh, children's ministry program here at Crossroads and, and several others that are focused on reaching out to the neighborhoods to reach children and students. Uh, and we have a, a Crossroads has given us, you guys have given us a generous budget in that direction. Um, but we want to go above and beyond this week uh, to, to sponsor that, that mission throughout the year. We get to share the gospel with 120 some kids at Kids Club every week in this school year. We had 133 kids in this building two weeks ago for BBS. We got students going out even tomorrow morning into, into San Francisco, into the Tenderloin to share the gospel and share hope and compassion with the people there. So there is awesome stuff happening all around and we want to just, we want to bless that. So if you, uh, we're going to take another offering. Uh, if you want to put something in there, uh, you can use your credit card on the front. Uh, also, we'll be, uh, we'll be in the courtyard. We're able to, to swipe your card and take your card in the courtyard if you want to find me or my wife uh, to do that. Uh, this goes directly to efforts for Kids Club and BBS and student ministry and Awana and all the things that we do here at Crossroads to teach the gospel to the next generation. So let me just pray and bless that. And then we're going to take that and we're just going to share a couple things with you before we go. Father, we just thank you for the burden it is, for the joy it is to, to share the gospel with kids and the students, to give them Bibles and to uh, smile with them and hug them and, and send them to camp, send them on mission trips and give them experiences where they're exposed to you and your goodness and your provision. God, I just pray, Lord, that you would give us generous hearts, that you would would pour out from our lives for the things that you've given us, that it might pour into this ministry and overflow, so that kids would come to know you, they may see the good deeds of those in those ministries, and they may glorify you in heaven. It's all about you. I want every single dollar that comes in these baskets just to give out you and your kingdom. I pray to Jesus' name. So feel free to, to be generous and give. Uh, I mentioned last week that we, our goal is to raise $5,000, which, given the size of our church, is only $17.95 per person. Uh, so that's uh, it's a, it's a small amount to pay to, to reach some kids. Uh, I want to give you one uh, example. So if anyone's here who's going with the City Impact tomorrow, I want you to come down here real quick. We're, we're leaving tomorrow morning. Yeah, you. Um, uh, yeah, where's our guys at? Um, there are eight of us headed tomorrow morning, headed to the Tenderloin District in San Francisco, to the organization called City Impact. And uh, we're going to share hope and compassion and love for these people. Um, Kevin, could you come up here a second morning? Kevin's one of our elders. He's gonna, he didn't know this until second. But he's going to pray for these kids. There's a microphone over there. Microphone over there. So we're, we're missing a couple here. Uh, yeah, I think they're going to show me this. Coming out, but, um, they, they've raised funds a lot, which you guys have given. Uh, and we're going to go and we're going to experience some really cool stuff. We're going to lean on Jesus, and he's going to give us words to say to people who just just going to do this. But we're going to do some of this stuff we talked about this morning, and we'll let you know next week how it goes. So can we just pray for us? And Absolutely. Heavenly Father, God, I just want to um, lift up this to the Lord as they go to a uh, challenging area of the city, um, Lord, tomorrow that they uh, have your full protection. God, but more than that, Pastor Brad said for this earlier that they have your full light. That they shine. They look so different than their area of the city. That it would be so attractive for people to come hear the story about what Jesus did in their life and how he could change things. So Father, we ask for your, your peace as this team goes forward, Lord, your protection, your provision, 
and your blessing and the light that's in each one of these kids and staff and pastor Lord would shine just just so amazingly, God, that they would see your presence in that area. Lord, we lift this up, Jesus, in your precious name. So, uh, Pastor Nana is away, and so he's uh, left me in charge, for better or for worse, but let me just give you a message from me and him and the elders, and we, we just want to let you know what a joy it is to pastor you guys. Um, we love you. We love sharing the word with you. We love opening this building to you. We love um, being there in times of joy and crisis. Um, we just want to let you know that you are loved, and we, we find a great joy to, to love and serve you guys. We do. We love our hearts. And with that comes the great expectation that God's going to use you powerfully. I expect so much of you. I expect almost as much of you as I love you. So I want you to know this week. So I want you to go out. Um, I want you to feel sent out. So we talked about Romans 10. Who can hear unless they are told? And who can be told unless someone preaches to them? And who can preach unless they're sent? I mean, we just speak for another. We just speak for another. We're sending you. We send you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, would you guys stand with me? We're going to send you out. Father in heaven, great Holy Spirit, by your power and your strength, I send these people in the name of your Son, Jesus, out into this dark world as sheep among wolves, given the power of your Holy Spirit, the words to say, the compassion, the love, the patience, everything they need make an impact for your kingdom. And they might build your kingdom here, but it might stand forever and ever. Help them overcome their help them overcome their weaknesses, use their strengths, help them to believe the truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we love you. We send you out. We'll see you next week.